I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. A Duluth City Council task force continues to take input on a proposed earned sick and safe time ordinance. We'll talk about the ordinance and what it could mean for workers and for businesses. Well, the Clyde Crane Company operated in Duluth for nearly a century before the doors closed back in 1987. Now a reunion is being organized to celebrate the company's record-breaking products. And we'll have a report on the mobile Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall on exhibit in Superior this weekend. These stories and more next on Almanac North. Well, hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And Julie, we have an interesting lineup of topics this Friday night. Yeah, it's a busy show. It lots, is, lots to talk yeah, about tonight. Might as well get started. All right. Thank you, Denny. Welcome, everyone. A task force set up by the Duluth City Council has been studying the idea of an earned sick and safe time ordinance in the city. The task force has been holding listening sessions as it gathers input from the public and the business community on the potential ordinance. Joining us now with more on what is being considered is Mary Faulkner, a member of the Earned Sick and Safe Time Task Force. David Ross is the executive director of the Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce. And Eric Forsman is a member of the Earned Sick and Safe Time Task Force. And thanks to all of you for coming in on a pretty rainy Friday night. Mm -hmm. I sounded like you all dodged the, <laughs> dodged the <laughs> downpour as you came in the door tonight, but appreciate it. Thank you. Mary, can you explain to our viewers um, how a sick and safe time ordinance would work and you know, what it would require or could potentially require of businesses in our community? Yeah, I can get us started. Um, one of the things that we're doing right now is we're taking community input. So we won't know how the ordinance will work at this stage because we're really just still in a fact-finding, information-gathering stage. What we're going to do as a task force and part of our charge is to present the city council with recommendations. And ultimately, it'll be up to the city council to figure out how to put those recommendations into place in an ordinance and then what it will look like going forward. So. Our role is, is fairly limited in that we are gathering information through our own research. Mm -hmm. uh, we're having these public input sessions. We've created a survey that's available on the city's website. Um, and then we're going to engage in our own discussions and bring those recommendations forward. Is there a presumption going in that there will be a recommendation to the council to enact some sort of a, an earned sick and safe time ordinance? Not necessarily. Uh -huh. Uh, so what we have been tasked to do, and it's really helpful that the ordinance lays out, or sorry, the resolution that created the task force lays out what we are to do. So the idea is that we could come back to them with a range of recommendations, and then really it's for the city council itself to kind of decide what they think is the best next step. Eric, why is a task force needed in the first place? Why not just leave it to business people and their employees, like it's been for decade upon decade upon decade? Well, that's a question that we're being asked as members of the task force. Certainly, we've received a number of input from businesses on both ends of the spectrum, really. But at the beginning of this conversation, back in July of 2016, the city council was really being looked at to just pass a mandate without much of this research that we've collected. So I am glad that the city council, councilors Alyssa Hansen and Zach Filipovich, sponsored the resolution to put the task force together and really look at this from a year-long perspective. Do research, look at what other communities have done, and then ultimately make those recommendations. But we are hearing input on both sides of the issue on whether this is needed or not. David, what are you hearing from the business community? There is concern in that we're not sure what this will entail. And any time you have uncertainty as a business owner and operator, it generates angst. And so we were delighted that there was a task force if not for this task force and an opportunity for a year's time to evaluate this and gain input, gain perspective from business owners and operators, this would have been acted upon by the city council last June or July, which would have been very onerous, 
brought great uncertainty to the business community. So at least we have this time of discernment, which we fought hard to have, with the idea that this will be brought back to the council in October or, no or November of this year. Mm -hmm. What are the concerns that uh, you have as someone who represents the, the business community? An unfunded mandate, mm -hmm. the uncertainty that it represents, and until we still don't have any specificity and as to what this will actually entail. And because of that, people are saying, well, how are you as a business community responding to this? There's no definition to it. It's right now a viewing different options that are being proposed. That is why once the city council accepts a recommendation of the task force, which again could be in October or November, we ask for some time to now with this new found definition, the ability to plan for, staff for, finance, this initiative, that will really be our first opportunity to do so. So I hope that the vote that occurs in November is not to be beginning of this, but rather a time of discernment and a time of evaluation. So hopefully an extended period for business owners to then respond to the specific ordinance. Mary, this is called earned sick and safe time. Correct. I think a lot of the folks in our audience tonight know what sick time is. What is safe time? What is that? Safe time is a really important component of this ordinance. Sometimes workers experience sexual violence or domestic violence, and that means they need time away from work. They might need time to seek medical treatment, they might need time to work with the police, they might need time to go to court. So the idea is that as a component of this ordinance, we would look at whether or not we could ask businesses to say, if you have a worker who's in this situation, can they use earned paid time off to meet those needs that they have as a survivor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've been collecting a lot of public input. What are some of the challenges, Eric, that you've been hearing from, from workers who feel a strong need to, to have this in their workplace and in their lives? Yeah, we've heard a lot of different opinions from mm -hmm. workers. And I just want to say, whether you're on the worker side or the business side, or maybe not on either of those sides, I want to commend everybody who's come out and spoken. It's very difficult, I think, to get people to come and do public speaking on any topic, but given a topic like sick time, which can be very personal, I think it's been uh, quite remarkable to hear some of those stories. If, if this passes, would all employers be affected or only employers of larger businesses? Is, is there a cutoff? That's currently what we're, we're looking for input on. So the survey that Mary alluded to talks about different sizes of employers, if we should be differentiating. You know, City of Minneapolis, City of St. Paul, both pass an ordinance, they're slightly different. There are others across the nation that do differentiate and don't on topics like that. So that's all input we're looking to receive right now from our community. Mm -hmm. David, I imagine you've been watching what's been going on down in Minneapolis and St. Paul with their ordinances. Any uh, thoughts that uh, come to mind as you look at what they've been doing and what should or should not be included in a local ordinance? We have followed very closely uh -huh. both those initiatives and what's been happening or did happen at the state legislature where this was being evaluated on a statewide basis. Minneapolis does have a couple of uh, exceptions. If you're a business of five or fewer, you're exempt from their earn sick and safe time. And if you're a business of one year or less, you are exempt. Whereas in St. Paul, there are no exemptions to the rule. So we are hoping here in Duluth, if this does go forward, and we anticipate it will, that there be some exceptions made for businesses of a certain size, smaller businesses, mm -hmm. micro businesses, and for, as we've even learned through St. Luke's recently, some accommodations for organizations to prepare for this because they have pointed out at St. Luke's that this will be very onerous for them as well as a very large employer. So David, would businesses be audited each year to be certain they're compliant? How would that, that be enforced? Great question. One of the things that the task force is working with and on is how will this be enforced at the city level? Will it be volunteer or will it be a staff member within the city of Duluth? But somehow it will have to be the city of Duluth charge since it is a city of Duluth initiative and ordinance mm -hmm. that they within their staffing complement have the kind of enforcement that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Mary, is a, a picture starting to emerge of what this could potentially look like in Duluth? Or are you starting to see some ideas come together where you get a sense of what it might be? 
I would just echo what Eric said earlier, mm -hmm. is that we still really want the community to yeah. come out. And so we're really looking for participation at these listening sessions. There's one more. It'll be next Thursday mm -hmm. uh, at Community Action Duluth. We want people to go and take the survey. Uh, we want people to reach out to mm -hmm. David if he is someone who is kind of in their network and has ideas about this. There are other groups like Vision Duluth and Take Action Minnesota. So there's lots of places where you can find information. And we really just want the whole community to do participate. You, do you want this passed before a new city council comes in? I think the city council has given us some <laughs> thoughts on that themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't think personally, I don't know, Mary may not share this and our other task force mm -hmm. members may not as well. I do want to take the time to get it right. So. The council election certainly isn't at the forefront of my um, thinking when mm -hmm. we make this decision. All right. Well, thank you so thank much you. for coming in and talking about it and for the work that you're doing on this really important topic. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Now, let's dig into our news file archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. This was the scene in Superior last month. A Burlington Northern train derailed, spilling its toxic load, forcing the evacuation of thousands of Twin Ports residents and sending a blue chemical cloud hovering over the Northland. This is the scene today as crews attempt to finish cleaning up. It will take all day and part of the night to pump out what could be as much as 4,000 pounds of chemicals, most of which is butadiene. The product people, uh, the uh, Novacor and OHM, uh, feel that, uh, that the material, uh, given the condition of the tank cars, should be removed from the tank cars. So they're going to pump the residual out today, clean the tanks, and uh, flare off any remaining product. Authorities say there's little danger of the chemicals escaping but they're not taking any chances. The area within a thousand feet of the tanker car has been blocked off. One family has been asked to leave and the workers at the Greenwood Cemetery have been told to go home. To ensure the public safety, Novacorp would have preferred to remove the remaining cars rather than just cleaning them out. But a court order has been issued to keep the cars in place because of pending lawsuits. In Superior, Laura Cowan, KDLH News. Well, the Duluth plant of Clyde Ironworks closed its doors for good back in 1986. Today, the old Clyde buildings have been repurposed as a restaurant, event center, and a hockey and recreation complex. If that old building could speak, it would tell tales of the huge and useful cranes and hoists that were designed and built there. Our guests are here to share some of that history and talk about an upcoming reunion of former Clyde workers. Greg Cerniak was the Director of Project Management at Clyde and is a member of the Reunion Committee. And Dave Beattie was the Worldwide Field Service Manager at Clyde and is on the Reunion Committee. Thank you both for being here. And Dave, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the history of, of Clyde. When did it get started? And it, uh, Clyde actually started in Duluth in uh, eight, late 1800s. Mm -hmm. And they started out making uh, equipment, and most of it was hand equipment for the logging industry. And then they developed a, a uh, uh, I forgot what it was called, derrick mm -hmm. to, pull, to lift the logs and move forward from that. And, uh, and then they ended up making uh, steam winches and uh, things to move logs, pull so logs. In, in, and in their heyday, how many people in a and a typical year worked at Clyde. Ooh. Several hundred? <laughs> How many yeah. do we have? Greg? 150 to 250 mm -hmm. in a typical year, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It all depended on how much how much business, business was in, we had. <laughs> the works. Backlog yeah. and that, so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the different markets as they entered them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dave, you, you mentioned that you're wearing a shirt from back in the day. Yes, uh, what, what do you remember from back in the days that you want to kind of uh, relive as you think about bringing this reunion together? Well, really, I think it was really not only challenging, but really fun working yeah. for Clyde. We were proud of our equipment. Uh, we had a 
fantastic engineering crew, uh, you know, world renowned. And uh, the early, early products showed that, uh, you know, they were involved in many, many major products. Some of the largest dams in the world were built by Clyde Equipment, the Empire State Building. Uh, Dave can speak to some of these early projects. And um, as the years went on, there were just more and more uh, world record breaking type of engineering coming out of it. So Greg, why did the Duluth plant close? Well, really, there was uh, a combination of things that came to uh, uh, convince our corporation, which happened to be at the time the largest crane corporation in the world. Uh, they had facilities all over the world, you know, Germany, uh, France, uh, uh, Montreal, Canada. All these different facilities were helping Clyde build these cranes these, because they got larger and larger. They had to be pr produced, fabricated on the water. You couldn't transport them by truck or rail or anything. Uh, our largest crane that we could transport really tri typically was like a 32 <laughs> or no, 28 really. Well, you could move a 32, but it took On a rail many car sideways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, couldn't, you couldn't put it on a truck. These components were just So back in large. the 1980s, did the company move to another town? No, actually, actually, during the 80s, we had such a huge backlog. I mean, it was incredible. At one time, we had an order for 12 stevedoring cranes going through at one time. Um, the backlog from the offshore industry was just unbelievable. One crane after another, the, the backlog was getting bigger and bigger. And you asked, why did Clyde move? Well they had to start producing these cranes closer and closer to the marketplace to be competitive. Sure. And unfortunately, you know, uh, Clyde, uh, you know, had a union shop here and uh, we were competing with the South, the Gulf, as an example, where, you know, a lot of components would be, other companies were fabricating like components, hoist, derricks, cranes. And that kind of, kind of was, a, a trend at the time, a lot of a lot of this work started to move first to the Gulf of Mexico sure. and then overseas. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dave, what's it like for you to walk into that building these days now that it's been converted and yet still well, they they've tried to preserve a lot of the history. It's totally different, but it brings back <laughs> a lot of memories. You can because uh, well, personally, I worked there for 21 years before they left town. Uh, many days spent in that those buildings. And it was really interesting to see the yeah. buildings refurbished to do something. It Dave, really tell us about the reunion. Uh, the reunion, we hope to gather most of the people that are still living in the area, first off. But uh, there are others coming from quite a distance away, which we mm -hmm. hope they all make it in, in good health. Because many of them are getting quite a bit older. When is it and where is it? It is August... Fourth and fifth, fifth, Friday and Saturday, from noon until five o'clock, both days at the Clyde Iron Works mm -hmm. in the old machine shop, of course, at the event center. Mm -hmm. And I understand that it's not just the old employees, but also suppliers and others that, that work We've with the company We've got many as well. suppliers in this region, which are actually thriving right now, like yeah. Duluth Brass, uh, this IPS Corporation, which has uh, been involved in the... Uh, uh, crawler crane and locomotive crane mm -hmm. part of American, but now, uh, you know, they have actually hired sure. some of these laid off employees okay. from uh, when Clyde moved, or Am Clyde moved to Houston. Okay, and with that, we have to leave it. Leave us, uh, Greg, Dave, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Great story. Thank you. Thank very you. good. The traveling wall that heals, set up on Barker's Island in Superior this week, it features a half-scale replica of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., 
as well as a mobile education center. WDSE crews were there capturing the arrival of the wall, the opening ceremony, and local reaction. Julie Kellner has our report. In the early hours of the morning at Barker's Island, as the promise of dawn lights the sky, already there are visitors making lonely pilgrimages of memory and honor to the wall that heals. To touch a name, say a prayer, and remember those who served and made the ultimate sacrifice during the war in Vietnam. The Wall That Heals officially arrived in Superior on Wednesday morning. The huge trailer was carried in procession through town led by members of the Patriot Guard. We're just honored to be here today to be part of this. Being a Vietnam era veteran and not a Vietnam veteran, it means a lot. I've had the opportunity to go to DC and see the actual wall. This brings the wall closer to people who would never have the chance to go there. Hulver Lines Trucking Company applied for, sponsored, and coordinated the event for the community. We applied for it because we'd actually been hauling it for a couple of years and I've heard so many stories about it and um, I learned a lot more about it and I just thought it was just such a wonderful thing to bring to a community. Well, it's very important for Hulver Lines because we have a, a large percentage of veterans uh, that are employees at our company. Uh, approximately 40, 40 percent of our employees are veterans. You know, it, it has been a challenge and, and I owe a lot, of, a lot of thanks to some really wonderful team members at our office and the community really, really stepped up uh, to make this a success. The Wall That Heals is a traveling half-scale replica of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Uh, it was first put on the road in 1996 as a program of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. Uh, we take it to 42 stops a year uh, throughout the country. Uh, this year uh, here in Superior is uh, certainly one of our more northernmost stops and we're excited to be here. We have a 250 foot uh, uh, memorial that's going to appear in the, in the scene behind us. And it'll look exactly like the wall in Washington DC with five feet at the height and tapering down to zero on the ends and listing the 58,318 men and women who perished in Vietnam. But one of the special things that we have because we're the organization that built the wall is that we're able to travel with a mobile education center. The magic of the wall that heals in the Mobile Education Center is that for the next four days, we'll be open 24 hours. So until we take it down on Sunday afternoon, it allows people to come down and experience this at night. It's an honor and a privilege for, the, for us at Halver Lines and with the City of Superior to welcome you and to welcome the wall that heals to the City of Superior and to the Northland. I'm very proud to live here in Northwest Wisconsin, which will be the only stop of this memorial in Wisconsin. And I think that's fitting because we have one of the highest populations of veterans in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I believe that speaks to the character of our people here and the value that we place in our country, in our history, and in the direction that we want to go as a people. The Vietnam War was the first war fought not only on the battlefields, but we saw every day on our nightly news the debate of whether we should be in the war, the wins, the losses, the death toll both of the enemies and of our U.S. soldiers. They were debated not only family-wise, but community-wise and nation-wise. Our country was literally torn apart because of the debate. The debate moved from a debate to a protest, from protest to riots, riots to bombings, shootings, injuries, and ultimately deaths. In the middle of this was returning Vietnam vets. We didn't give them a ticker tape parade. We didn't thank them for their service. We didn't congratulate them for serving our country in an honorable way. They were greeted by jeers, sometimes worse, and they ended up melting back into our society quietly with no real thank from our community. I would like to personally thank the Vietnam veterans for their service. Thank you, veterans. As the opening ceremonies came to a close, visitors began to move along the wall, looking for names, paying their respects, and remembering. Well, back when I was 14 years old in 1969, John Bazinski was my neighbor, next door neighbor. I mean, our houses were so close we could actually touch 
both of them at the same time. And I was sitting on the front steps of my mom and dad's house when the army car pulled up and two gentlemen got out in their dress greens and started walking towards the house. And John's mother came out and she just started crying. And it was a very sad day, very emotional. And to this day, I remember it like it was yesterday. The wall that heals will remain at Barker's Island until 3 p.m. Sunday. And we need to tell you that WDSE WRPT is working on a local documentary project featuring our own Vietnam War veterans. We would like to invite veterans to share their memories with our video crews who will be set up at the Bong Heritage Center from 10 a.m. till 2 p.m. Saturday. At 3 p.m. there will be a presentation about the upcoming PBS documentary by Ken Burns about the Vietnam War. And the wall that heals will be open and free to the public until 3 p.m. on Sunday. Well, it's time now for the business news from the editors at Business North. Duluth Business University will close after 126 years, longer than any other college in the Twin Ports. The decision came seven months after the U.S. Department of Education stopped recognizing the group that accredited DBU and 265 other colleges. That followed allegations that some for-profit colleges used predatory practices to recruit and provide loans to students who later found their certificates had little career value. DBU never faced those allegations but could not recover from low student enrollment following the loss of accreditation. Tecora Resources, Inc., a new Grand Rapids firm, has acquired the assets of the Scully Mine located in eastern Canada. Several officers of Decora formerly were affiliated with Magnetation, including CEO Larry Leitonen and his son Matt. Decora has entered into a five-year agreement with Cargill, which will purchase 100 percent of the high-grade iron ore concentrate the new company produces. Scully Mine is the third largest in Canada. Betsy Harries was selected to succeed the retiring Dale Kupsek as Ashland Area Development Corporation's Executive Director. Harries is an Ashland native who received an officer commission in the Marine Corps the day she graduated from college, serving in a law enforcement capacity. After separating from the military in 1992, Harries was employed as a forester and forest firefighter in Missouri and worked with Douglas County Forestry in Solon Springs. She also spent several years with the U.S. Forest Service and ran her own business. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. If you have a comment on our show, call now. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message. You can also send an email to almanagnorth at wdse.org. And don't forget to visit the WDSC website for program schedules, the latest news from your public TV station, and any special events. And Julie, we certainly hope people can get out to Barker's Island this weekend and visit with our WDSC crew at the Bong Center tomorrow. It is so important to capture that oral history from the Vietnam era. Yeah, so, vitally uh, we so. Hope people show up. Mm -hmm. For Julie and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.